Okay, welcome back. Uh, it's time to next. Uh, it's time to next session. Shall we get started? The next uh, next session is validation and test. We have uh, today we have one presentation for validation and test. The title is "High Latency and Its Effects on TSN Performance." Uh, speakers who are Martin and Elon from Keysight Technologies. Please start your presentation. Hi. So thank you for joining us. I get to be the first presentation after the break, so everyone's coming in. So today we're going to talk about file latency and really looking at latency variation and its effect on TSN performance. So what are we going to talk about today? What are the delay measurement points which define where we measure the, uh, the delay and how do the various specs define them? How does the latency of the phi and its variation affect TSN performance? And we're going to look at 802.1 AS and 802.1 QBV, officially known as 802.1 Q scheduled traffic. And 802.3 CX is a standard that's going through, it's a proposed standard going through a IEEE 802.3. It's currently in sponsor ballot. That is looking at time saving improvements. We're going to talk about what that changes. We're going to talk about how do we characterize phi delays. We're going to look at some measurements that we've done on a couple of phi's. We're going to then give some summary and recommendations. Hopefully, you'll find this useful. I know we have. So let's talk about delay measurement points. Delay measurement points define where we, the points between which we measure the delay. Per IEEE standard 802.3, the timestamps are measured at the generic reconciliation layer, which is between the MAC and the MII. But the timestamps actually represent the time at the connector, known as the MDI, or media dependent interface. The delay between this connector, the MDI, and the generic reconciliation sublayer is this data delay and the thing that we're trying to characterize. So 1588 in a little 1AS specified the timestamps represent the value at the MDI. Between the two, we have the phi. Now, 802.3, 2018, uses the estimated, and I shouldn't say estimated, I should use the uh, basically five values that provide an approximation of the delay based on, that are provided as minimum and maximum values to compensate for the phi delay. But that's not accurate. That could be a range. And the, these delays can vary from frame to frame. Then the timestamps themselves are measured either at really the, the, at the first symbol of, of the data or at the uh, SFD. And 802.3 was not c completely clear about it. There were two interpretations. It's one of the things that's being addressed in 802.3 CX. So let's talk about what we mean by phi latency variation. So phi latency re relates to the delay from the MDI to the MII in the RX direction and from the MII to MDI in the TX direction, right? Just then file latencies vary due to many different issues, including different clocks and clock boundaries, different buffers and the initialization of those buffers. Sometimes when the, just depending on the timing of when the FIFO gets initialized will change the delay inside that FIFO. Insertion and removal of idles due to different Ethernet clock rates. If you have a, a, effect, forward error correction, then the position of the start of the frame versus the, the start of the FEC block uh, can affect the delay because the FEC block inserts uh, additional overhead data in the, 
basically in the parity bits that are added that the so that effect, so the things that are close to the to the start of the fake block have a different delay than things that are at the end of the of the fake block. Similarly, for multi-lane uh, files, the buffer delays are added to align the frames. But uh, how those bu because you're adding delays uh, to each of the lanes, those delays are different. That affects. Uh, the, the latency of the file. You now have additional delay that, uh, that's being added with, within the file path. It's between the connector and, and, the, and the Mac. Okay. In this presentation, we're going to use the, the, uh, uh, the following terms. We're gonna t t when we talk about file latency delay variation, we're talking about the, the, the maximum absolute value of the difference in the expected, i.e. the average file latency and the a actual file latency. So we have, when we say max file latency variation for the Rx, it's in the Rx direction, file latency variation in the Tx is in the Tx direction, and when we just use the term max file latency variation, it's the round trip, which, which has the combination of both Tx and Rx variation. Okay, so what are the effects of file latency variation on to the 1As? So we affect several things in to the 1As. So the first one is the a propagation delay measurement, the, the, the PDLA request response. At a high level, the maximum PDLA error that can be done due to latency variation is equal to the max file feed. It's the total of the, of the TX and RX uh, direction. It's not twice that because we actually take the sum of both directions, but we divide it by two, so it only ends up being max phi LV, not two times max phi LV. For the sync time accuracy, though, uh, there are a couple of errors that go in there. You have the maximum error in calculating the time at, at the, uh, when the sync Rx is equal uh, to, or the maximum error in calculating the time when we receive the sync message is equal to the TX uh, phi latency variation plus uh, the latency variation on the RX side on the follower that is receiving the sync. Now, the worst time error could be two times the, the, the max phi latency variation due to the combination of both the PDLA and the sync error. And finally, when looking at the GM rate ratio calculations, uh, while compute GM rate ratio calculate allows any scheme to be used, the spec requires a plus minus PPM maximum error in, in the rate calculation itself, but says nothing about the time stamp accuracy. Uh, and so, it, uh, and the worst case calculation, which uses the previous two sync values, could lead to an additional two times max phi latency variation error. So, if you had a phi that gave you a one microsecond. Uh, file latency variation error, that could, it could lead to a four uh, microsecond error in the time if, if no other correction was done. The, the, uh, Edo to the one allows you to do averaging or other algorithms to potentially compensate with, but there's no, it's not standard. There's nothing that says you have to, you know, average this much. It, you just, uh, and so it is left after the implementation. Asymmetric file latency variation also can cause further inaccuracies, but we're not going to dig into that here. So, then on QBV, then when you have longer than expected file latency, that can cause the frame transmission to end after the gate closes by as much as max file V. In the other direction, if you have shorter than expected file latency, then that can cause the file transmission to start as much as phi max LV after the gate open time. So what? So this can cause several issues. You can delay, potentially can uh, delay priority frames by up to f max file latency variation, but uh, it can cause the, 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 the it could be not enough bandwidth being allocated to a queue, and it can cause buffer, buffer overflows due to gates being open longer than expected because uh, you know the data was sent. Now if and Ada 2, that one QBV implementation that knows the, 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 the latency variation in the phi should compensate for it by essentially by reducing the window size such that the window is never violated. But effectively, that means you get less data through the window. 
Most implementations don't take that into account, meaning they either violate the window or, uh, or uh, they uh, required uh, the management to, to take some co corrective actions, such as adding some kind of a guard band when creating the window. Okay, so I want to talk about the, the 802.3CX amendment that's going through the SA ballot, the sponsor ballot right now. So 802.3CX does several things. I listed the main ones in here. It provides a mechanism to report the dynamic phi delay change to the phi. Now, no, no, I don't think anyone's going to, at this point, is going to physically do it. it, it it's, it's a logical connection, the, the phi and the Mac, but it says, hey, Mac, you can compensate for the delay in, in, on a frame-by-frame -frame basis. The, the phi can say, the delay in, in, in this frame was x, and, and, and that can be compensated for. Now, this is more likely to be, to be implemented in, in a device that combines a Mac and a Fi, but it also effectively makes it valid to do what a lot of devices already do, which is to have the uh, timestamp insertion within the Fi and still be 802.3 compliant. Okay. Now, the, other, the next thing it does is it provides a configurable selection of either the first a symbol of frame data or the first symbol of SFD as a measurement point. It really says the, the first symbol after the SFD, not the first symbol of frame data. Uh, but uh, the previous version of 802.3 left this unclear. Uh, but this allows the implementation to support either or both choices, enable selecting one. The spec recommendations to use the first, the first bit of data really, really mean the first uh, symbol of the data. Uh, and this is intended to match 1588. There's a problem there. Uh, the, the 1588 spec it define, uh, it treats a symbol as an octet. The 802.3 that th uh, that spec, uh, a, a symbol can, can be many things. For example, it can be a 64, 66 symbol. That's a symbol in 802.3 terms. Uh, uh, or it could be you know, uh, something else, but hopefully that'll get resolved before the spec is uh, resolved. I submitted a comment on this. The next thing Editor 3 cx does is provides clarity on, time, on how timestamps should work in five multiple lanes with forward error correction and insertion removal of idles to avoid adding uncertainty. And finally, it adds support for sub nanosecond timestamping resolution, allowing support the high accuracy mode of 1588. Okay, so talk about, so now. Go ahead. Yeah, so, um, hello, this is Marty. Um, now I'm going to talk about um, how we went about characterizing some of the FIs that we use or um, our customers use. Because as Alan mentioned, um, the variation in the FI can have a significant impact on the system. So one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to configure a system and we wanted to ensure we had a mix of different frame sizes. Um, and a lot of data to come up with um, accurate um, measurements of, of this phi delay. And um, you can see here, we have a little block diagram. Uh, well, we have a traffic generator, we have our device under test, and a traffic analyzer. And then what we want to do is we want to measure um, at the MAC and at the MDI and come up with a very accurate time of the data going through both um, um, egress and both transmit and receive. So um, pictures are always um, good um, to show how we went and did this. So here is um, our traffic generator. Um, this allowed us to um, create um, a variety of different frames and we could also load the payload with specific data that helped us match things up um, when we um, did our analysis. Um, this over here is what we use to separate the T1 um, data paths because, of course, we have a single pair and we got um, data going both directions. So we have two sets of directional couplers so we can look at data going through the link in both directions. Um, so this is the MDI point. And then on the MAC, um, what we did is we instrumented the data as it went into the phi. So we have 
um, an oscilloscope probe here on the transmit, one on the receive. Um, so we're actually using um, two channels here and then two channels to look at both the transmit and receive um, on the oscilloscope. Now, um, I would certainly recommend an oscilloscope that has T1 decode capability. That turned out to be a really big plus, um, as well as 8B10B um, framing and decoding. Um, those are two things that we used. Um, and this particular scope also had triggering, which, um, which helped T1 triggering. So here's a, um, a picture of um, both the transmit and receive. You can see this is a PAM3 signal. Um, we made these measurements at 100 meg and at 1 gig, and we're in the process of looking at 802.3 CH phys at 2.5, 5, and 10. Um, now, this at 100 meg, um, we can get by without equalization, but of course, we're in the middle of the data path, which is the worst place that you want to make that measurement. So for the higher data rates, um, we, we would turn on the equalizer on the oscilloscope so that we could clean up the eye and, and actually um, sync up and, and make the measurement. Um, and this is um, on the SGMII side. Obviously, that's a much cleaner. It's, um, we don't have a single pair in um, echo cancellation and all the things that T1 um, gives us but also makes difficult for us. So once we capture the data, um, um, you can see these are our captures. Um, we use the decode capability. So on the far right hand side, we actually have the T1 decodes and we have the 8B10B data. From this, um, we used our traffic generator, created a variety, of, we, we basically made all different random um, um, packet sizes, um, did a complete analysis, and then we wrote a script to match up the data um, on the Mac and on the MDI so we can match it up and statistically come up with what that delay is. And of course, we were very interested in this. Um, uh, we were hoping it was going to be a very um, consistent fixed number because with a fixed number that offset could be compensated for um, and we were hoping we'd have a very tight range. But that's not exactly what we saw. Um, the most important thing we're looking at here is the range. Um, because it, if it's a fixed value, we could always compensate, but the range really hurts us. And you'll notice on the first five that we tested, on the TX side, we had a, a range of 189 nanoseconds, which um, was a, very disconcerting to us. And then when we looked in the RX side, we, it was even more disconcerting. Um, we had a range of over 600 nanoseconds. So when you think about this variability and how it, um, and how it implies back to what Alan was talking about earlier and how that gets multiplied, um, this, is, this is really bad, okay? So we started looking at other phi's. Um, we looked at a different sample. This one was better. Um, this is a newer phi. It has some additional capabilities. We saw a range on the TX of 70 nanoseconds. The, the RX, now let me point out, the scales are different here on, than on the previous slide, but the, um, the RX was really pretty tight except occasionally, you know, because we'd send thousands and thousands of bytes of data, occasionally we'd have an outlier that was, um, that was frustrating because this outlier, you know, it was out at 200 nanoseconds. Without that outlier, for the most part, this, this phi was much better. So this is how we went about um, making these measurements. And, um, you know, it was very interesting to see these and then to think back at how, how it relates. So we'll let uh, Milan finish up here and talk about some of the next steps. Thank you, Marty. So I want to talk about phi performance and, and why this is such an important part of any kind of a time-sensitive system. So I think the point here, as many of you guys already know, that phi selection is the critical part of design of any time-sensitive equipment. And the performance of that phi, including latencies and, and, and variations, need to be known. And 
It's also very dependent on the configuration of the file. So if you have a file you, uh, you configured for certain frame size, you config, configured for different maximum frame size, it changes the delays. If you change the, the interface use, you change to, uh, to using, uh, in, you know, SGMII from uh, using, you know, GMII, it, 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 the latencies and variations are different. Most phi data sheets do not list the phi and phi delay variations, and even the ones that do are often wrong. It is actually, we've seen multiple times where a phi data sheet li listed delays, then only to come out with a revised version of the data sheet that removed the delay information. Because they fig so they removed the incorrect information, but never went back and put in correct information. And so uh, the best thing I can say is if you really want to know the phi latency today, do ask the five vendors to provide it, but also measure it yourself. The, as I said, the selection of the MII interface can have a big impact. There's a big difference, not only in, in, in the latency, but latency variation. Because, for example, SGMII or any, will have an additional, additional clock boundary crossings versus, let's say, GMII. Do, and so there's additional buffers and, and clock boundary crossings it typically add additional variations in the delay. Also, enabling various features inside the phi affects the latency. So, uh, MACSEC or even uh, affects uh, the delays and, and the delay variation, and even enabling GPTP timestamping within the phi can change the phi latency. So, you, uh, it, it is, and it's not always what you think it's going to do. And uh, finally, uh, we've seen cases where a, a new firmware uh, uh, caused latency variations to change significantly, or latency and latency variation. And uh, what, what was supposed to be minor uh, uh, silicon revisions, you know, going from, you know, whatever, ver version B to, to uh, ver version C, that was, uh, had significant effects on, on variation. So you, you have to keep, to keep track of it. It is important to make sure the phi is properly characterized to avoid surprises later. So every time something changes in the phi, you have to characterize. I recommend doing some type of characterization every time you make a change or potentially in, in some kind of regression system. Put some potential mitigations. Choose the MA interface mode with the lowest latency variation. Do not use phi features that increase the latency variation. See if you can avoid them. Make sure that file latency compensation in the macro NIC can be adjusted to accommodate different file phi, phi revisions so, so that if, it, if you do have a new revision of a file, it becomes a minor software update, not something that's you know, very hard to change. Uh, consider using the files to timestamp uh, GPTP frames. So that, that, that's, it's a double-edged sword because typically when you do timestamping inside the file, you're going to have much more accurate 802.1 AS timestamp, but now you need a servo to synchronize the time between the PHY and the other system components, such as the Mac. You may be limited as to the rate of 802.1 AS frames or specific encapsulations because many PHYs have limitations into only what they're doing. The PHYs that can handle only about you know, 10 801 AS frames a second, for example. And but really the biggest limitation is it doesn't solve the problem for 802.1 QBV. You've, you, you now have the accurate times for 802.1 AS, but the latency variation is still just as big for the, for the uh, 802.1 QBV. So, instead of, so the, the 802.1 QBV still has the same noise, instead of, but instead of being generated in the phi, the noise is effectively now generated on the other side because the timestamp is based on the phi. Now, finally, I'm going to say it is possible to use alternative methods of measuring frame Rx or Tx times, which is there are some files that can provide a pulse for each frame Tx or Rx, and you can use those. Those can go into inputs in, in your uh, CPU or ASIC or NIC. There are many NICs that have inputs that can timestamp inputs, and you can use that to accurately measure the time uh, of the frames. But as with phi timestamping, this helps with 802.1 AS, but not with 802.1 QBV. So these are some of the, th some of the techniques that exist. There, there are others. And finally, some summary and recommendations. 
as file length and length variation can be very different on different files. We see them all over the place. They're different not only between different vendors, but between two files and two firmware versions of the same vendor. The latency variation affects to the one as Q, uh, QBV, as well as any other protocol relying on accurate delay measurement compensation. File selection characterization is, is, is critical to any TSN system. And, and I'm going to make some recommendations to both device slash module manufacturers and file manufacturers. So device and module manufacturers should require file vendors to document and guarantee their file latency performance. They should choose a file configuration and MIA interface that meets their file latency performance requirements, and they should characterize the file to make sure it meets the state requirements. Now, an even stronger message to the file manufacturers is that they should strive to minimize or provide means to minimize the latency variation, document the delay and range as required by ADO 2.3, but not done, and implement uh, the, the proposed improvements in ADO 2.3 CX when approved. And that's uh, our presentation. Thank you for the presentation. <clears throat> okay. Are there any questions? Hi, thanks for this. Um, please, please speak your name and yeah, I was just going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Don Panel from NXP. Um, I had a question on when you uh, said that 802.3 uh, CX was clarifying. Uh, the the start point or the timestamp point. Yes, and you said it would, recommends the first bit of data. It's really the first symbol of data. I, 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 the, the, it's really the actually the, it specifically says the first symbol after the SFD is what it's. The okay, so 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 yeah. since eight hundred two point three also defines the next bit after the SFB. D to be the D the first bit of the DA the destination address. Yeah. I wouldn't call that data. I agree. That, that, I, I, I agree that my slide uh, w was not as clear. The, cor the, cor uh, the, co uh, the correct definition is, is the first symbol uh, after, after the, the SFD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that's yeah. much clearer. Thank yeah. you. Any further question? Uh, I'm Hiroshi Takatori from Axon. Uh, we are the one of the be five vendors, and then yeah. I'm a little bit surprised to see some variation in the link-up uh, latency. Okay, uh, can you show me page 12 or 10 around there? Sh showing, yeah, 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 whichever it is, okay. As far as I understood the latency, most of the portion of the latency yes. is on the channel. The, this is not measuring the channel, this is measuring just the file. On the, okay. Uh, from TX to MDI? It, from M for, yeah, from a MDI to MII. Okay. Or MII to MDI, really, okay. uh, yeah. So, all right, so, yeah. All right, so is this data, the factor late, okay, so this is a one, is this a, is this data 100 meg or? This is 100 okay. meg, 100 base T1. Okay. Do you have a data like a 1G or 2.5G, 5G, 10G? So, so we, we, have, we have one gig data. Okay. We have one gig data and we're, and we're putting together the two and a half, five and 10. But okay. We, we, Do we you have, see such kind of a big variation when we go to a 10 we, a we, G? So on one gig, we actually see, in some cases, bigger uh, variation. And, and uh, I think some of that has to do with uh, the FEC implementation and, the, and correcting for uh, the FEC. W one of the things that, per 802.3, when you timestamp uh, frames that are using FEC, you're supposed to use the start of the FEC block, not the... Uh, that contains the SFD rather than the time of the SFD itself. And that's an area that some files don't quite get, or really, I shouldn't say file, because it's an issue between the Mac and the file. Oh. The Mac doesn't know the relationship of the FEC block, hmm. doesn't know the relationship of the start of frame to the FEC block, so that adds its own uh, inaccuracy. 
Mm -hmm. And the the longer the size of the of the fake block, mm -hmm. the bigger the uncertainty that's added. I see. So so uh, so that's one gig. Two and a half gig. We are in just now in the, in the process of setting it up to measure it. So in the next conference, I says, if you guys want us to come back, we'll have data on that. Okay. Uh, uh, so is this variation once link is up? Yes. Still there is some variation. Yes. And, and, and this, it, it, the, the, the result of this is not because of the link up. No, it's not. Okay. okay. This, and this, we've basically measured, uh, in each case, tens of thousands of frames. Uh -huh. The scale here, uh, we didn't put it down, but this is actually a logarithmic scale. So you've got a very high percent of the, uh, you've got like 99 percent of the frames that are actually with this specific file end up being in a, in, in a range that's small. And then you have, at the very bottom, you have a bunch of outliers. But, f from, but those outliers, for whatever reason, mean that some, some of our things are gonna, be, are gonna be wrong. We're gonna send some frames outside of the QBV gate window because we have these outliers. Okay, uh, one final question is, uh, is, is the significance of this latency variation, is that because of the multi-lane uh, uh, from application point of view? Yeah, well, this is a single lane phi. Okay. Right, this, this is 100 base T1. Right. Right, so there's, it's only a single twisted pair, single lane. Mm -hmm. But if you have a multi-lane phi, you, you know, typically the, the effects between a lane are gonna add a fixed variation every link up, right? Every link up, you're going to align the different lanes to each other, and each buffer is gonna choose a different position. So every link up, you're gonna add a you, something's gonna be a little bit different. But once your link, once your link is up, mm -hmm. It does. It, 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 it it's a fixed amount. It doesn't vary from frame to frame. Uh, right. where, yeah. So yeah. the latency issue yeah. is uh, very critical, not only multi-lane but also single and, yes. application. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, this is Karl Wattweiser from BMW. I, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for that interesting presentation. Um, actually, one question or maybe a remark. Um, what we see is latency variation from the physical layer, which must, actually, which does not necessarily imply an imprecision, right? Um, if, for example, the latency variation is properly compensated by the GPTP protocol, um, that's fine. So if you take notion that the sending took maybe in that instance something like 931 net nanoseconds and for the other GPTP frame 890 nanoseconds and you compensate for that, that is okay. Exactly. Um, the thing where I'm actually interested, so you're doing the first step, you show it's a potential problem, right? But is it a real problem? So is the delay compensated or is it not compensated? So this is, I actually talked about this with, within the uh, mitigation. So one of the, uh, so if one of the, one of the, the simplest way of, you know, compensating is to use five base timestamps. Five base timestamps compensate, essentially, you, you, the delay is no longer, the delay between the, the, the MDI and the MII tip is compensated for them. The, when the, the five timestamps themselves are usually, by the way, that requires a different test on its own because we've seen some implementations where the five timestamps are also wrong. Uh, by some amount, they have some, their own latency variation. But as, if, as, assuming the file latencies are perfect, they solve the problem for P, uh, PTP, which, and that, as you said, that's, that's one of the solutions. There are, there are other solutions that, that so if, you can comp, if you can measure what the delay is, you can compensate for it, that's what I was talking about here. Like I said, some files can provide a pulse, that's another way of doing it. And we, we've, imp, we've done that in some of our equipment. But we've used you know, an, an IO on the file that told us, hey, the frame was transmitted now. We latched that and that became our time step. We, we could compensate for the delay, especially in two-step PTP, it works perfectly. Okay. It doesn't help as much with, with 801 QBV because 
you need to know ahead of time what the delay is going to be. And it doesn't help with one step, 802.1AS, because then ahead of, you need to know what the time step is before you send it out. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Was this tested at room temperature? This was tested at room temperature. Uh, this specific fiber, we, we, we did try to uh, vary uh, the temperature, and we actually didn't see a significant variation due to temperature. And how about humidity and, and we did shock? We did not test uh, humidity. We did not try to test voltage. We did not, we, we did not try to test any, any of those effects. We, we saw enough variability at room temperature to cause us concern. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. Hey, my name is Geet Modi from Texas Instruments. Uh, the data you presented is for SGMI interface, right? SGMI to 100 megabit. Yeah, in this yeah. case, it is SGMI I to 100 base T1. And SGMI is known for the variation, but do you have similar kind of data for the MI interface, which is more? Not currently, but as I, as I put in my presentation, I expect MII to be better. But I do, we do not have those measurements right now. Okay. Thank you. That was one of my recommendations was specifically to, to use MI to yeah. choose a better interface. Yeah, because MI is much more predictable. Yes. Hi, this is uh, Colt Correa with Intrepid Control Systems. Uh, so as far as the data goes, um, you said you have a lot of data uh, coming uh, into the PHY that uh, is grouped together, and then you have uh, some, some outliers. And I'm assuming, is it correct to say that the outliers are not grouped together? In other words, uh, maybe you don't know, from, or maybe you haven't analyzed the data in that detail, but uh, w is, it, is it the case where the outlier comes immediately after some, some, some latency that N is... Uh, uh, no, and, and, and they also don't come, we don't, we don't see them like at the very beginning, we don't see a burst of outliers. Mm. We see it every once in a while, it's like, it's like, a, it's like you have a straight line and a blip. Yeah. You've, you've got, and, and they don't seem to be, we haven't seen any what I call periodicity or pattern to them that, that we can discern. I'm sure there is a reason for them, I'm sure there's something in the fight that's causing them, but there's... You know, there's nothing obvious that was obvious to us, and we, we don't know the inside of the phi. So, someone so, who was, so what we can take from that is that it'd be very difficult to create some kind of compensation logic. Exactly, that, that, those outliers, yes. and that's the difficult yeah, yeah. situation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say on, on the first phi, um, there was a lot of outliers, and they were very random. The second phi, it was very, very sporadic. We would see just one or two outliers. So it just depends on the phi, but they were there, and they repeated but it took thousands and thousands of bytes before we, we could get that outlier. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to add uh, one thing here, which is having, even if you do the timestamping within the Mac, if you, if you, un, if you know the phi's behavior, you can, you, can do, you can compensate for some things. For example, if, you, if, the, if the Mac knows the relationship of the start of the fact frame to the start of the TX frame, it can compensate for that. But today, there's no method to do that. So it, it, even if the time are inserted before the PHY, if there's knowledge of the PHY's uh, architecture and, uh, and potentially uh, some starting state, um, further compensation can be done, but it, that, that is something that requires, you know, uh, that information to be available, and better yet, if there was some, a standardized way of doing this. Thank you. It's okay. It's time to finish. Oh, we need to set up uh, the next uh, session. Thank you.